right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the panel called Collaborating Across Fields. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know that almost no one here got sleep last night. Uh, and um, anyway, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll describe briefly what we're gonna talk about and then introduce very briefly our distinguished panelists. Um, uh, but anyway, as investigative journalists expand the scope of their newsrooms, partnerships, and topics, they increasingly are collaborating with groups that would have seemed unlikely just a few years ago, data scientists, health researchers, environmental scientists, social workers, and more. Here are three pioneers in reaching across their fields from the U.S., Canada, and India. Um, and I will um, introduce them in the order of their speaking here, I guess. Uh, hope I got it right here. So, um, Syed uh, Nazakat is an award-winning journalist, media entrepreneur, and editor-in-chief of the Center for Investigative Journalism in India. In 2015, he also set up a data journalism initiative called Data Leads, which conducts data analysis boot camps and runs India's first data-driven website dedicated to healthcare reporting called Health Analytics. He has reported across broadcast, print, and online journalism in over 25 countries. Our, these are brief snippets. The full bio is online. I'm gonna introduce the other two speakers very quickly. Uh, Peter Klein uh, in the middle, or sort of the middle, uh, uh, is an Emmy award-winning journalist and the founder and executive director of the Global Reporting Center in Vancouver, Canada, former 60, former and still occasionally current uh, producer for 60 Minutes. Uh, he is currently a, pro a professor of journalism at the University of British Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. His global reporting center oversees long-term investigative projects. And last but absolutely not least is Deborah Nelson, who um, is an associate producer of investigative journalism at the University of Maryland in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, she shared a Pulitzer Prize for a Seattle Times series and co-edited Pulitzer Prize winning investigations at the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. And again, all of these are much, much longer. Um, just in a sentence or two, I've been doing investigative reporting for about 40 years and uh, um, my, my bio is there, but I also worked at 60 Minutes and uh, and anyway, i uh, started two organizations that went on to win Pulitzer Prizes, Center for Public Integrity, and International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. But anyway, we will start off on this interesting subject about collaborating across fields uh, with Syed. Thank you so much, Jack. I think it's, uh, it's really uh, wonderful to be here. And in the last uh, two or three days, we have been having, I think, intense discussion about you know, the sustainability of journalism, how to make investigative journalism sustainable. And I feel one of the biggest challenges we as, a, you can say, organizations or newsroom leaders are facing, essentially our whole conversation remains within our own community, which is journalist. So I don't know much about the West and Europe, but essentially in Asia. So what happens is that if you're a great journalist, you do a great story, you go to press club in the evening and you tell your clicks, hey, I did a great story. And they say, oh, let's have a wine, let's enjoy and celebrate. And next day they come back and say, I did something great. And you, you know, congratulate them. And so the conversation is kind of reduced to something where you should not really have been there. Like uh, it is last four, five, six years or 10 years where we saw technologists slowly coming to mainstream journalism as a web developer, coders, which is a great thing to be honest. And it has really strengthened our capacity as a journalist. And I, I've been a reporter for 17, 18 years. And by I think 2013 or 14, I was quite convinced, at least in India, we have an opportunity of doing something new, something different. Why so? Because and the laws were changing. There were new laws which allowed us to file something you have in America called a Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and uh, then a lot of other things as well. We got cashless economies and other stuff. with a lot of data coming in. But then our challenge was I never covered uh, health or any other areas besides national security. 
So I was covering essentially army, I was essentially covering military, I was essentially covering conflict. And I thought like if we do anything data related stuff on these subjects, the government is certainly going to have a, yeah, you had to stop it down. It's under official secrets act, you can't do it. But I was personally desperate to try uh, something where we can experiment with collaboration with people. We can say this is not controversial in the country and nobody's really bothered. So eventually, my wife is a doctor. I was having a breakfast with her. And uh, she said, why are you thinking too much about it? If you really want to start a, like a <clears throat> media outlet and experimenting with something, why don't you do something on health? And nobody is bothered about health. People die. It's not a sexy subject. And you know, like, it's not a war. It's not uh, like Pakistan. It's not China. So nobody bothers about the subject, actually. And you can meet doctors. You can speak to them and see whether this is why. I have no idea what the health beat as a reporter is because I never covered it. But eventually, we started that initiative. So I have a couple of slides. I will go through them because I will miss them otherwise, if I do. Otherwise, there's no need. But I just want to see. Yeah. So what we did, essentially, was that we brought together some uh, 20 journalists and 20 editors together in a remote part of India, called, uh, at, at the northern part of India at a one medical college. We thought, let's have a discussion with the doctors and maybe the researchers or public health specialists or people who collect data, medical data, how we can tell these stories more powerfully. And my fear was that, actually, I thought, like, maybe the journalists will come, but the doctors will not come for the, they're busy people and they may not come for the event. And I reached the venue at 8.30 in the morning. The room was half filled. The doctors were already in the room, but the journalists were coming one by one, one by one. Well, that was a first surprise, because that gave this, uh, the, this little bit assurance that people are really interested to collaborate with journalists. It's just a matter of whether you are making the right effort to reach out to the people. So we started that boot camp from here. And you can see the date, number 14. Uh, 2015 was our first boot camp in the northern part of India, where we had 20 doctors and 20 journalists at that place. We have a video about it as well. If you Google it, Data Boot Camp Kashmir, you can see it. And you can see the reactions of the doctors, what they said when they attended this workshop along with journalists. And then quickly, you can see how it became quite popular. In just next two, three months, we are in another part of India doing the same thing. Then we are moving towards the Bangalore in 2000, same next year, and we are having almost 150 people. And these included actually the couple of billionaires who are investing in pharmaceuticals and all. And they wanted to also understand how journalists work and how we can have a good conversation with them. And one of the ladies, she's uh, maybe not in the dance there, but she was one of the speakers. She's the richest uh, woman in India. And she came, she said, I will come only for five or 10 minutes. I don't have time, but I'm really liking this initiative. She ended up actually spending whole day with us. And she sat as a student, trying to understand like, how journalists work and all whatever, and investigative journalists. And David Kaplan actually, actually joined this session via a video call. And it was a great experience for the journalists also to have this world global view of what's happening and what journalists are doing. And then we moved, uh, I have to deal with it. Yeah, then we went to Nepal, same year. Then we went the same year to Malaysia. And then we went to Bhutan. Then we went to Delhi. Then we went to Colombo. So uh, we went across. So this is actually, you know, the Chiang Mai in Thailand. So we ended up doing a series of these initiatives across Asia. We never thought actually we will go beyond India. And the beauty of this, uh, this uh, was that we got a really good understanding what doctors think of journalists first <laughs> and uh, of our reporting as well, the way we write on health and all whatever. Second thing was these people came with a lot of, they were domain experts, the oncologists, ophthalmologists, data researchers, public health specialists. They brought incredible insight. What are the key stories which media was not covering or covering actually? So, uh, so th that was a great learning for us. And I can show you a couple of stories which we did that time. And see, we are, we are having issues here. So this is a very interesting story, which we never really realized, that almost every year, 2 million Indian children in this region 
two million die before their fifth birthday. Two million every year, and this is not the story anywhere. So we collected data from the different government sources and all, and we tried to figure out what's happening there. And this story was amazingly interesting again, because we thought people who are poor commit suicide. That is our understanding of suicide. Poor people commit suicide. But we went had the health of these mental health experts and all this, you know, this is not right. If you look at data, we provide you the data, you look at the data, you will get a different picture. When we had that data, so we actually had this understanding, that this is the rich part of actually India, the southern part compared to the north, which is more, this is the poorest belt of India. This is completely richer belt. Karnataka, Andhra, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, West Bengal is not that rich. But we saw this state, Karnataka, Amira is from Karnataka, we saw the highest suicide rates in Karnataka, which is one of the most prosperous states compared to the other Indian states. And when we looked at the data further closer with the health of these uh, doctors, we found out that a good chunk of students every year commit suicide in India. Most of these suicides happen just one month after the board exams. So that means if you provide proper counseling during or after the board exams, you can save these people from deaths. And then another thing which was quite interesting for us, we saw the corruption in, um, in health. So these are the five states in India, huge states. And we saw the medical equipments, the x-ray machines, the MRI machines. And we looked at the data audit reports of these medical equipments. And we figured out that 68% medical equipments in government hospitals in one state, where millions of people live, were dysfunctional. What does that mean? If a poor person has to go to government hospital, because uh, healthcare is free in government hospitals, but the MRI machines and other diagnostic machines are not working in those hospitals, that means these people, the 68% means huge when we say about this one state. I think it has a population of like, which millions, I think it's, uh, Bihar has two crore, 20 crore, I think it's, it's, it's in millions. So millions of people actually, because they don't avail the government services, they are actually pushed to avail the private services, where a normal test costs a couple of hundred dollars. So this was again a, but this was again a data which we were never able to gather unless the doctors who are part of these boot camps would allow, help us to why we are not auditing it and why we are not investigating it. So I think this was really a uh, great learning. Yeah. Then we had another, uh, another story about that the, the India's health minister went to the parliament saying that the seven states in India have no case of rabies death, the dog bite death. And we again checked data with the different you know, uh, officials who collect data because they were part of this boot camp. And we figured out in this state, for example, alone here, there have been so many dog bites and three deaths. And the minister said there was no death. In this state, where the minister said there has been no death, the officials came forward and said that we are not collecting rabies data in our state. So how is this data coming that there has been no death? And in Delhi alone, where the minister went to the parliament and said there's no deaths in Delhi, there were 20 deaths in only you know, one year. So all this, there was this problem with the data collection, but this could have never happened if these doctors were not part of this boot camp and uh, collaboration. So my sense of things is it's good for journalism if we collaborate with the deep domain expert people. Because they can be your whistleblowers. You got a question? I will come back to you. Okay. Yeah, I don't actually know. No, the, I think we're okay. I'm not showing anything. So <laughs> yeah, we're keeping it short. It's okay. Okay. Actually, he's a German, so I don't know what the what to put. Okay. <laughs> so I'm struggling with the language, actually. So like, yeah. So thank you so much. Okay, it was easy. <laughs> uh, so I think the, having this collaboration with the deep domain experts really worked for us, and more more recently. I'm going back and forth, actually, to just show what's happening. And more recently, I think just uh, two months back, we started something called Health Analytics Asia. 
and which is an initiative of building collaboration across Asia with doctors, data scientists, and healthcare researchers. It got recently awarded by the Membership Puzzle uh, Award, and we already opened this, uh, I think, two months back. And one of the key uh, thing of this network is now actually to fight the medical misinformation in Asia, because uh, we run a, a quite a massive project in India, uh, along with the Google. There's a, there's a mistake here. It should be a 10,000, not a lakh. So uh, we trained almost 13,000 plus editors and journalists in the last one year in fact checking. So we're using that network now helping doctors to become the fact checkers. So we put an open call on our website to any medical doctor in different specialties if they want to come over and join journalists to fact check. To my surprise, the first three people who joined that network were Chinese doctors. Like we have no contact there, but we have a network. We have friends in Hong Kong and all. They maybe spread the word. We, help, we saw their help and they put it there. But it was good to see three Chinese doctors one with a 20 years of experience in public health, immediately joining up and saying, I will give two hours every month voluntarily to your network to help your journalists to fact check medical misinformation cases in China. We've got a doctor from Pakistan, a public health doctor working with the borders, with doctors without borders, saying the same thing, I will give two hours, because we're asking them to give two hours every month. And our plan is actually to have one doctor, at least from one each Asian country, in next couple of months. We already have, I think, uh, 10 or 15 who we selected out of 40 who applied, and because we wanted to keep journalists out of this network. We thought, like, let's have, because we are journalists, we are already our editorial team, but we want to have a collaboration with, the, with doctors and data scientists and all. So my sense of things is that it's good for journalism if we really go beyond our newsrooms, go beyond our conferences, and whenever we do conferences, we make sure we have an equal participation of non-journalists in the conference. I think the future of media conferences, even the for JIJN eventually will be to have more domain experts. Of course, we'll have journalists, 1,000 journalists, but less of 500 people who have nothing to do with journalism, and bring them closer and build a conversation, because that will help in a couple of ways, in storytelling, getting sources, and also audience, because at the end of the day, we're creating content for audiences. What, may, what I think may be a great story may be not a great story. So it's good to have that quick feedback from the audiences as well. So I will conclude with that, and then we'll do a discussion later. Back up, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, are there other slides now? Peter has two yeah. slides. Uh, well, I, I mean, I would, should I just do a brief little presentation, or should we? I guess. Um, That's better. Yeah. Like, well, I'll just give a kind of a quick, uh, sort of a quick um, follow-up to this. Um, I just have two two websites, if you don't mind opening those up. Um, so I, I run the Global Reporting Center. Um, which brings journalists and academics together. Um, the, the, this format is partly due to actually Chuck here, because Chuck is I mean, he's super humble in his bio. He was sort of the legendary grandfather of nonprofit journalism in, in the US. And when I started the Global Reporting Center, um, invariably, virtually every single day, funders and others were saying, well, how are you different than Center for Public Integrity? How are you different from ICIJ? So I was like, fuck you, Chuck. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I realized we needed to really distinguish ourselves. We can't just fill the void of, of, of global journalism. We needed to really figure out what we can do to, to, uh, to distinguish ourselves. Um, and I realized we're based at a university. I'm based at the University of British Columbia. We're surrounded by all these amazing experts. Um, why don't we bring these academics into the newsroom? But that was easier said than done. Um, and I mean, you know, Said is, has achieved it remarkably, but there's, there are cultural um, distances between academics and journalists, and there's a lot of suspicion. Academics often think journalists, we, we tell the stories, you know, too simplistically. They're always critical of the stories we do. Um, journalists think the academics, you know, are elitist and, and are kind of stuck in the weeds and, and, and only care about, you know, publishing in peer-reviewed uh, journals, and those are, you know, both accurate kind of viewpoints. At, at 60 Minutes, where, where Chuck and I have previously worked, um, you know, our old boss, Don Hewitt, would always say, just never interview an expert. You can interview anyone you want, but don't interview experts. Don't, I don't want professors on the show, because he was all about telling stories, not, 
not doing stories about issues, but doing stories about stories, you know, interesting narratives, interesting experiences. The one time I had an expert was doing a story about Shiites in Iraq after the invasion of Iraq, and I thought virtually no one in America has ever heard of Shiites or Sunnis. They don't understand anything about that, so I wanted someone to give some context. Um, I went through a huge effort to interview this guy, and they screened the piece. They said, great piece, just get rid of the expert. <laughs> so my one effort failed. Um, but at our center, we've been trying very hard to work with um, subject area experts, not just to um, you know, collaborate as we do stories, but actually to identify stories. So this, this project here, Out of the Shadows, is a project we did with the New York Times, um, and it really grew out of a conversation from one of our board members, uh, advisory board members, um, who is a physician, um, actually a physician of Indian origin, who uh, said, you know, the largest burden of disease in the world is, is depression. Mental health is a far larger burden of disease than, than you know, any other um, condition out there, but it gets the least attention, and it's often some of the most difficult conditions to treat. Um, it has a huge economic burden, social burden, uh, as well as obviously um, mortality and morbidity. Um, so, you know, it's not a topic that we would have necessarily taken on if it wasn't identified by this physician, but I said to her, to Videsh, you know, you have to come with us to the field because I don't feel like we're really equipped to ethically deal with this. Interviewing people who are psychotic, you know, th that, that gets really complicated on an ethical level. Um, just in terms of the, the complexity, how you know, community-based mental health care works uh, in lower resource countries and places where there's still huge stigma, there are very few physicians. And so, I mean, we did this project that won a whole, whole range of awards, but it, um, we went to uh, Togo and Benin, we went to, uh, and we did a project for the New York Times, we did a documentary for Al Jazeera for um, people in power in, in India, and then we did a project on refugee mental health uh, with the Times. And, this project would not have happened if it wasn't for um, for for this uh, you know feedback and participation from a physician. The other example I wanted to give you is a project that just launched yesterday, um, and uh, something we did with with NBC News. Um, also, grew out of um, collaboration with a subject area expert, Daniel Pauly, who's one of the world's leading fishery scientists, um, and uh, who's based in my university and said to us that, you know, a quarter of the world's fish that are caught from the ocean are caught specifically to make fish meal. They're small fish, pelagic fish, sardinella, anchoveta, things like that, um, that people often don't eat, um, and uh, sometimes they do, do eat it in, in, in poor coastal communities, but, you know, it's not tuna, it's not salmon, and a quarter of the world's fish are taken out of the ocean to make, to be ground up, turned into powder to feed fish farms. Most of our fish these days comes from fish farms, and so we're taking fish out of the ocean to make fish farms, but they're the bottom of the food chain, so there's huge, you know, environmental um, uh, threat there. Um, but again, we had fisheries scientists with us in the field, and it was instrumental having them there, not only because they gave us sort of scientific context, but they really thought in different ways, like for instance in, in, uh, in Joao Senegal, uh, you know, we were there, we were looking at this fish meal factory pouring effluent into the ocean. And so the scientists said, you know, we should ask people if they have any health concerns. So we started asking people, and every single person was saying, my, my child is sick, my, I'm sick, I, you know. I, and they all were ascribing it to the fish meal factory. In some cases, they said their doctor said it's because they work or live near this fish meal factory. Um, there had been no studies done on this. There was one study done in India, um, and that's about the only you know, scholarly study that's been done about the health effects of living near a fish meal factory. Uh, and it found, you know, dire health health consequences. So none of us would ever have thought as journalists to take samples because I don't even know how to take a sample. I didn't have, you know, complex scientific sampling equipment or anything. But this um, fishery scientist said, let's go buy a bottle of water. And he bought a bottle of water, he poured out the water, and he said, now we have a, you know, relatively clean vessel to collect our sample. And we all sort of looked at him, and he collected a sample, and and a big sample, and then brought it back. We got some engineers to, to study it, found that there were four heavy metals that were several times above the lethal dose uh, exposure limit, uh, according to the, um, uh, the CDC. And one of them was 2,000 times the lethal dose limit. Um, so, you know, understandably, these people were, were sick because they were being exposed to this. But it's an example of, um, this is a, a documentary we did with NBC News and a multimedia project. On, uh, on the fish meal industry that, as I say, just, just launched. Uh, but the, the, the 
scientists were co-authors of these projects. Uh, we bring them into the newsroom, and we have a new, new project on, on, uh, on global supply chains. Um, with, again, it's ha exactly half of our collaborators are, are uh, academics, political economists, fishery scientists, timber scientists, mining engineers, whatever it might be, uh, and half of them are journalists. Um, and it's the other, the other benefit to us is the diversity of funding. As we all know, it's difficult to get journalism funded. Um, that hidden costs uh, of Global Supply Chains Project, we raised $2.5 million through academic funding. So these are, these are funds to support academic research. There's more and more uh, push within uh, the public funders of academic research, like Social, Social Science Research Council in the US, or the National Endowment of Humanities, or in Canada, the Social Science Humanities Research Council, and, and similar ones in, in Europe, uh, there's more of a push to make that academic research relevant to what they call knowledge mobilize it, to bring that academic work from, from the sort of ivory, ivory tower into the broader world. Uh, so these academic funders are more and more interested in the kind of work that we, people collectively in this room do, journalism that we do. They want it to be academic, academically rigorous, but they also want it to reach a broad audience. So there's a potential there for, for funding the kind of work we do as well. I don't go like, off the rails here. All right. <laughs> Not trip. All right. All right. So rather than settle, I guess we have to use a mic for the those people who are lying in bed and streaming <laughs> this morning. So, so rather than settle for you know already baked research that doesn't quite answer our question. You know, if it did, we wouldn't have to add, ask the question, right? Why not work directly with the researcher to answer precisely our question? I think that's what we're talking about here, is not settling for research that's already done. And um, so I had this idea a few years ago. You know, I do my work for Reuters. I do, pro you know, even though I'm at the uh, University of Maryland on faculty, I do projects on, on contract with Reuters. And so um, I wanted to, you know, I noticed that news coverage, in fact, I'd done a student project on rising sea levels about how, you know, what was, gonna, what was in harm's way 100 years from now if sea levels continued rising. And um, it occurred to me when we finished that project that, you know, news coverage had really largely focused on these dire predictions 100 years in the future. Um, and that's what climate skeptics were seizing on. You know, it's speculative to sow doubt. So I proposed to Reuters that we do a project that focused on the present. You know, what already has sea, rising, yeah, sea, sea level, uh, rising sea levels, what harm have they caused already? Now, this, that doesn't sound very original today, but this is a few years ago. Nobody had done, nobody had asked that question, or if they'd asked that question, it hadn't been answered. So. Sea levels had risen eight inches over the past century. Let's do a data-driven project that actually, thank you. Thank you for not making me do that. <laughs> that finds out systematically what harm it's causing. So to start, start with, I, first of all, I looked for some data on this. Couldn't find any studies that had been done on the here and now consequences of rising sea levels um, at a granular level. So I headed to the coast to look for clues. And I kept hearing from local officials and fishermen and coastal residents that flooding had increased over their lifetime. That they, these are longtime residents. They were sure that flooding had increased. But when I went to look for the data, 
that might support that, the anecdotes that I was hearing, it didn't exist. No government agency, local, state, or federal, was keeping track of how often floods, nuisance floods, low-level floods were occurring. So what do I do? So working with this genius at Ryan McNeil, a data journalist, we identified two federal databases that might provide the answers. One was the tide gauge data. I noticed going up and down the coast there are tide gauges. It turned out those tide gauges had been recording water levels for decades. The other was a separate database that listed for each tide gauge what the flood level was. These are two different databases and nobody had ever put them together. So we get the idea, let's put them together. But doing so was tricky, you know, scientifically speaking. So we went to scientists at the federal agency that collects the data and said, let's put, can we put these two databases together? And together we worked out a methodology that in fact found for the first time that, sea le that flood levels, you can see as sea levels rose, flood levels went up dramatically all along the coastline in the U.S. and it was playing havoc in cities all along the coast. So by putting our heads together, we came up, but of course we had to negotiate, you know, who got to publish first. So we, we did our story first and then they published, uh, I think a week later, they published their paper on it. All right, so. So we're doing this again on a new Reuters project uh, with researchers who not only have you know, the academic degrees to be able to answer our questions, but also have access to data that we can't, which is another reason to uh, collaborate. You know, the question is, can they answer the questions that no one else has answered yet? Not because there isn't an answer, but because no one, with the wherewithal at least, has thought to ask it and answer it. I mean, we produced striking new evidence on Navajo neuropathy. Um, it's a disease that was killing young children on the Navajo reservation. We did it by a combination of reporting and scientific skills, by bringing them together. My reporter, Judy Pasternak, did what reporters do well. She filed a FOIA request and fought for months with the federal government to get well testing data from the Navajo Reservation. I knew a scientist from a previous project whose specialty was rare diseases in children. When we put those two things together, his expertise and that well data that we had gotten together, we solved the cause of Navajo, partially, the cause of Navajo neur neuropathy. So as Saeed pointed out, you can save lives. You can save lives by collaborating. Now one of the big challenges, of course, is persuading scientists and those sorts that it's worth their while to answer our questions rather than or in addition to their own, what's on their own research agenda. And, uh, but what I found is they're like me in that they love a good mystery a good detective novel. So if I can present it that way, you know, then sometimes I get their interest. So um, it's actually, you know, and, and when we put our heads together, we can solve big problems. So if you think about it, look at our commonalities. You know, scientists like us, they begin, if we can speak their language, if we can reach them where they're at, they're more likely to collaborate with us. So like us, they begin with a hypothesis that they then try to prove or disprove, right? We're very similar with independent analysis of the evidence. Public health researchers, they track harm. That's where they start. They start with the harm. It's like, you know, when a disaster happens, when an epidemic happens, they're there. And then they search backwards to look for the cause. Anthropologists. Just like us, their research relies on finding people to talk to them. Computer scientists like us, they understand, they love data and understand it. 
And engineers, well, unlike most of us, I don't know, I don't want to speak for everybody here, but they know how to build things. So I love working with engineers. And uh, <coughs> so I wanted to segue to a project, um, you know, we're carrying this, this um, collaboration mission to um, students. We're training them up to be collaborators from the very beginning. We just got this nice grant to create the Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. And the, the grant is intended to create a university-based center for investigative collaborations. So by collaborations, interdisciplinary, intercollegiate, we work with other university journalism programs, and also student professional collaborations. So I just wanted to touch on the first project that we did that just published. So the center just opened and we started out with um, a project on how rising heat levels are affecting cities around the, around the world, I mean around the country. It was a collaboration we did with NPR. But as part of this collaboration, to find out how this heat is affecting lives, people, you know, individual lives, they um, built heat sensors to put in people's homes in um, Baltimore. So the student journalists built 80 sensors to see if they could monitor the heat levels inside houses during heat waves, the terrible heat waves <coughs> that, uh, hit the Baltimore area this summer. Um, so first of all, we were collaborating with NPR. Second, our data editor, <coughs> found um, open source code that was shared on GitHub by a journalist from New York who had done the same thing. But um, what we had to, you know, we had to actually build the sensors in order to carry this out. Now, Krishnan, multimedia prof, he started out by trying to build the sensors in his office and quickly discovered that the fumes were knocking him out. <laughs> and so, he went around looking for a better place to build sensors. And it was a great, it was, it was good he did because he came across the engineering department, which not only has the space, but also has the expertise. So they joined forces, providing space, soldering equipment, 3D printers for the cases, um, and guidance on how to analyze the data that, was collect, that we collected from people's houses. So for the first set of stories, seven sensors replaced in five houses, we'll have future stories using some of the other sensors, located in predominantly low-income areas that a satellite temperature analysis had identified as being particularly hot spots in the city. The finding, temperature and humidity in the homes were significantly higher than even outside and around the rest of the city and at unhealthy levels. So a heat index, I, I can't do it in centigrade, 116 Fahrenheit, that's really hot, right? <laughs> heat index. And it was 22, 22 degrees hotter inside than outside. So then the student data journalists also analyzed hospital data, found people in those neighborhoods were suffered from a higher rate of health conditions that put them at higher risk from heat exposure. The collaboration continued with Portland State University scientists and the Science Museum of Virginia to analyze heat data that they collected for the area and to also analyze tree canopy data with the Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab and the U.S. Forest Service. So they were able to find out that the tree canopy was, you could see, you could see the patterns here across, you know, the area where there weren't trees were the hottest areas and also the poorest shortest lifespan, high crime, and, low, and uh, high unemployment. This had a nice result. We won a $50,000 grand prize from the Online News Association for Innovation in Journalism that we'll use to help other schools to do the same sort of analysis. So we'll take that collaborative model and take it on the road. And it's actually the second time we'd partnered successfully with the engineering school. When I, we did the sea level rise project, um, the engineering school produced a map, an interactive map that showed what areas were at risk from rising sea levels for us. 
So a couple tips, and actually, we can probably get to these together, right? How do you how do you deal, how do you work with scientists? So maybe we can. Yeah. Do you think? So do you want to you want to mention those uh, before we segue to questions and other things uh, in general? Yeah, just, just yeah. some things you need to think about ahead of time when you're collaborating with um, scientists and doctors, and I'm sure you all have. But um, first of all, discuss the terms of the arrangement. You know what 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 are the terms of your collaboration? One of the big questions is will they get credit in the story and how? Now, I found that scientists generally do not want bylines. You know, that's death for them. They've got to be peer reviewed. Um, Ryan actually ended up as, a, as an author on a scientific paper with the scientists he worked for uh, because he discovered a new way to measure um, the particular medical costs. Um, so he was fine with that, but scientists generally don't want bylines. But how are they going to get credited in the story and how? Who's going to publish first? You know, you or them? Will they have a say in how the story is written? It's an important question to ask. If you're developing data together, who's going to have final say on how, you, how that data is presented? Um, how you resolve conflicting professional ethics or legal standards? You know, anthropologists, for example, um, you know, they take a vow of anonymity. The people they interview, they take, go to great lengths to keep them anonymous. And we're always looking for people to go on the record, right? And so you have to work those things out in advance. What else? Well, I was going to say one thing on that is um, it, it, at my university and probably many of many universities, um, you have to have um, an IRB or a behavioral research ethics review board for academics <coughs> to, yeah. to, to, to speak to people. So there, there's this sort of whole thing you have to jump through. Journalism schools are exempt from this because, you know, as you just said, you know, we can't be promising anonymity to everyone. We can't go back and check you know, academics have to go back and check before they publish. Well, imagine, you know, catching a corrupt, you know, politician, you know, on the take and saying, well, are you comfortable with my publishing the story about you, you know, being corrupt? Like, you obviously would never do that as a journalist. So what we do, I mean, I, I, I unofficially call it laundering um, academic uh, ethics, but basically when I send academics and jur journalists out together, particularly students, um, the journalists ask all the questions. The academics sit with the journalists and figure out the questions, but they're not allowed to talk to people. Like they have to literally not have any human <laughs> interaction with the sources because they haven't gone through ethics. So they can just observe, they can have sort of unofficial conversations and have lunch, but they can't do anything official. All the official interviews have to be done by the journalists. That's a great way around it though. Yeah. That's, ah, that's great, brilliant. Um, I switch into gears a little bit, but related to this, um, I, I've at American University tried to have uh, we had a public an we have a public anthropologist who's tracked all the military bases the U.S. has on planet Earth, which are about 800, I think, or 900. And um, this is a, a very basic thing compared to what you were just talking about. But um, we we wanted, he needed help with the mapping of it, uh, which is kind of fascinating. He had done all the research, he had the bases. So uh, our managing editor, the, I run something called the Investigative Reporting Workshop, uh, which has been around 12 years and does investigative reporting with TV shows like Frontline and Washington Post and others. Anyway, so they came to us and, and basically said, uh, we ha I have all this data, but I need to describe Display it visually in a book. So Lynn Perry, the managing editor, who is a head of graphics and photos for 18 years at USA Today, uh, took it over and provided all that material uh, from a graphic standpoint for the book. Uh, and then related to that, just before I forget or don't mention it, um, I was trying to create a thing called accountability studies that would blend investigative reporting techniques with academic in inquiry, um, and there, but the problem is there's six or seven schools, mm -hmm. and the one thing I did not have the stomach for was the bureaucracy <laughs> of getting six or seven schools to all agree to the same idea, 
and I had this image of uh, being about 87 years old and trying to still get them to agree. And <laughs> but uh, so I haven't. But I am really fascinated by this idea of primary data. Primary data is of great interest to journalists and to academics and to citizens and to everyone. I mean, and um, that's ner that's mana from heaven, right? I mean, so it's primary data, and so. That's the fundamental core to all of the things we're talking about, ultimately. Um, so um, anyway, I, I, that's what makes this subject so interesting, to the possibilities of collaboration with brilliant people who have niches that they occupy, but, and they have a sense of where all that, that great primary data is. Um, anyway, I don't mean to hog the things. We, at some point, we should take questions, I think. Or <laughs> but uh, do, do you want to say something? No, I, I was thinking, like, you know, the uh, journalists have also this uh, huge uh, issue with the egos. And we, um, when you cover a beat for five, ten years, you feel like you know everything about this subject. And you kind of, like, uh, dismiss the research, dismiss the work of scientists, or even, for that matter, any domain expert. So I think that that's harmful for journalism. We are... Uh, as it's mentioned, we are good at asking questions. We don't need to provide answers. We need to raise r right questions and find people who have the answers. That's how it should be, actually. So what we try to be do now, because essentially the ground reporting is dying across the world, and there are people who sit at you know like the desk and they write a kind of analysis and do questions, do answers, everything on their own, and <laughs> it doesn't. I think it is not good for. It's not good for sustainability as well because you, you the, the the audience then takes you like you don't nothing like i i see so many journalists cover science and health and if they're not trained if they don't ask right questions the doctors or the scientists will not they say well they just don't know anything we don't have time to lecture them about these things so i think the first thing in this collaboration essentially is what kind of collaboration you want, with whom, and what do you really want from them? Because they also don't have time. So you can't keep going scientists for a one single question five times. You need to be extremely clear that within, f I've got a half an hour, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let's be very precise what we really want from them. And then we have a conversation about that. Can I, can I say one thing along the, the ego line? I mean, hand in hand with sort of the ego of journalists, and we're all guilty of this, obviously, is also being really thin-skinned. We don't like to be criticized, especially by academics who don't know what the hell they're talking about. And, and so if there's an entire cottage industry of critiquing what we do, and almost to a person, we all ignore it and dismiss it. Um, but there's actually some really valuable critiques in there. Um, one of the projects we did actually grew out of one of, the, one of these critiques about how um, rare diseases are covered um, when w these these academics they weren't necessarily media academics they were more more health health uh, academics um, health economists etc um, were sort of critiquing us uh, I cover a lot of health stories so they said you know when you when you whenever you guys do stories on on rare disease um, what you do is you trot out some little kid some cute little kid who's who's dying of a rare disease and then you say isn't it terrible that little Timmy's gonna die because the province refuses to give him the this very expensive drug, or the health insurance ha has denied, you know, coverage of, a, of an expensive drug. Says drugs for rare diseases are super expensive. Um, says as soon as you bring out that cute little kid who's terminally ill, the conversation's over. What you know, it's very difficult to have a thoughtful conversation about how do the how do the you know where do these prices come from? What kind of public mo public money went into developing these drugs? All of these kind of complex things that the academics talk about. So we made an agreement with a, a number of scientists and and health health economists and policy experts to do a collaboration on, on expensive drugs or rare diseases and how it's covered. Um, but we would, basically half of the story would be academic context. So, you know, if there was the cute little kid who's dying, um, there would be a short snippet, like a three minute little video, but then there would be an interview or some other story that would put that into context. Um, and what was great about it, just from a journalist standpoint, is we found stories that we wouldn't have found otherwise. You know, the drug companies, uh, at least in Canada, will go to these people who are terminally ill or who have who have um, rare diseases and will pay them to lobby, to basically be public faces of the disease, to lobby the provinces uh, to, to cover these drugs. And sometimes rightly so, but sometimes these drugs aren't particularly effective. Um, and you know, if it's a $100,000 drug but it extends your life by a week, is that a really good use of public resources, particularly in a public healthcare system like we have in Canada? Um, so there was you know, a lot of complicated issues were 
rose up because we listened to the critiques of, our, of, of journalism. And it was a fabulous project that won a bunch of awards and, and, was, and used multimedia to basically contextualize these po powerful and, and potentially overpowering personal stories. That's great. Um, how about if we open it up uh, um, and can you identify yourself and, uh, and then far away there, but make sure you use a mic. It's right there, thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Meera. Um, I run a news um, magazine on uh, covering cities. And uh, this is very interesting, hi. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, on Thursday, I talked about a similar approach in collaborating but with citizens, within the citizen ecosystem, because even within citizens, uh, within the citizen group, you have engineers, you have computer scientists, you have data geeks, and you know, how do you work with water experts and so on, and how do you work with them and uh, collaborate on stories? And uh, one of the things that I we uh, face, or it's very common in the local space, is um, diverging or different agendas, right? As journalists, we want to uncover the truth, while citizens may, let's say a neighbor, neighborhood group wants to stop a particular project, and uh, for us, we just want to find out what are the violations, is there a scam, and so on. So there are different agendas, but the way we work is we kind of keep that out of the uh, you know purview of the story, kind of work on parallel threads, meet together, and yet, uh, complement each other's work, right? Uh, citizens know the neighborhood, they know the geography, they may do RTI request to get data, and we do our own investigation, cross-verifying what the government uh, processes have been, so on. So in this case, how do you find uh, uh, these sort of different agendas, and how do you deal with that? Like if you have uh, scientists or uh, no, I think, other groups okay, that you're working I, I, with. Yeah, very good question. I think this is a really, because our priorities are different. When we work w in a deep collaboration with scientists, maybe their priority, for example, is something different, but our priority is simply to tell the story. I can just give you a quick example. When we recently opened fact-checking to doctors, so it was uh, quite challenging for us. What are we putting on paper? What are we expecting from them? Are we expecting them to join us and we hire them full-time? No, we're not doing that. Are we expecting them to join us in an editorial decision making? We're not discussing that. All we are asking them to start the relationship is all about trust also. Like how you, li some people may get really closely associated with you, they understand journalism, they know oh, we can't go beyond, we can't change your headline, for example. So we put actually, a, we offer them a position, honorary position, mentioning in five bullet points what we expect from them and what we will give in return to that. And that was a very clear, so that they are absolutely clear the limitations of their work with us, that we told them that you can't work with any company, for example, which we are fact-checking. Or if we are fact-checking, please disclose that before you do fact-checking on that. We told them, give us two hours every month, and we will give you due credit on our page website that you are one of our expert, health experts, who is helping us to fact-check the story. And we also mentioned, I think, the meetings, that they should be available once a month for a video call because they're based in different countries. So I think it's, it's very, in, in different uh, partnerships, it's absolutely important that you put it on a paper and make it absolutely clear what is the relationship here. Because if you don't put on a proper official paper, then it means they expect that they will say, no, 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 put the headline like this, change this uh, yeah, nut graph like this, and don't use this photo and all. So have an understanding what uh, relationship you're building because often what happens is that you start a collaboration without actually thinking why you're needing this collaboration. And then uh, all, 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 all problems start in the relationship. I think it's, uh, it's good to put document the paper, put clearly the things which you see may it, uh, uh, arise as a conflict. And that actually saves the relationship and helps the collaboration to get better. Um, other questions, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Okan. I'm a freelance journalist here from Germany. Um, thank you all for your work, uh, first of all, and thank you actually all of you here at this conference for your work. Um, I'm wondering what the best ways to actually um, keep the non-journalists uh, um, engaged during such a project like you talked about or how to exactly involve them. Like, Do you invite them to use collab collaboration software that many journalists use like Slack? I think you probably have heard of it. or do you call them once a week? I'm wondering if they're not in the field with you anyways during the project, what, what the best way is to, to have them involved um, 
yeah, maybe you can, you have some advice on that. Thank you. I, 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 whenever possible, I ask them to be in the field with us or in the newsroom with us to really, we do use Slack to keep in touch. And obviously, you know, physicians and engineers, all these people are really busy. And their job is not to be a journalist. To sit in a journalism, you know, to a newsroom is probably not a great use of their time. But we try to keep them engaged. Um, I also, uh, I'll give a very brief example with this um, Hidden Cost of Global Supply Chains project where we have academics and journalists. Um, we're starting our second year of that. In the first year, um, what ended up happening is everyone siloed. The academics all went together and they were super excited and they, they were doing a, a special issue of, of a political economy journal, a peer-reviewed, you know, because that's the gold standard, right? Um, and the journalists all went in their corner and they were doing the journalism. And I said, this is not, the whole point of this is to bring you guys together. But I realize it's hard to, you know, these are, these are tribal, they're tribal people, right? <laughs> journalists like to stick together. Academics like to stick together. We're acculturated this way. So I realized I need, um, I need a stick and a carrot. And I basically said, um, since I signed the checks for all the funding, I said, no more funding unless you have a journalist and an academic collaborating. All, all proposals have to come in co-authored by at least one academic and one journalist. And that, that has worked <laughs> because they can't get funded otherwise. Yeah, and the current project that um, I'm working on uh, for Reuters, you know, we, we did that siloing just that you do naturally. We, we posed our questions. They went in, into a dark room and tried to come up with the answers. And when they came back with the answers, they'd answered the wrong questions um, from our viewpoint. And so we started, so we actually met in person and we had Zoom meetings and regular meetings where we go through the data together and the questions and answers together. And that's, we've made a lot more progress that way. And um, we've shared in other projects, shared drop boxes, um, you know, shared whatever your favorite, depends on how, um, I find a lot of scientists aren't necessarily familiar with, you know, Dropbox and Google, Google Drive. You have to introduce them to it and they're not necessarily comfortable with it. but. Um, it does make it easier if you can just share files, right? So I just have a quick follow-up question. Do you do have them share your Dropbox or invite them to use Slack? Do you let them see all of what they're doing or do you only invite them to certain channels? I don't know if that's possible on Slack because maybe you don't want them to see everything that's going on in your research. Do you want me to repeat that? No. Yeah, so I, I create a, a specific folder for sharing with people I'm collaborating with, or even people I'm getting records with, right? It's just like you'd, you'd treat with anybody else. It's, they don't, they look at my, what's relevant to what they're doing. Um, and I see what's relevant to what I'm doing, right? So it's a specialist folder just for our collaboration. But I'm doing a lot of reporting outside of that um, that's not in that folder. Does that make sense? Yeah? We, we share everything, but I mean, Again, we help them prioritize what's important uh, so they understand, you know, if they're going to spend some time, they'll look at this, but we don't hide anything from them. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Actually, one that, that follows precisely from that, which is, and this is probably for starters for Deb, but anyone can, can jump in. So Frank Lamonti, I'm a, a, a media lawyer and I teach at the University of Florida. Um, as a lawyer, when I hear sharing going on, I immediately think privilege. And I'm wondering, has anyone had that conversation about structuring the relationship in such a way as to make certain that reporter's privilege has not been waived so that if somebody subpoenas an engineer and says, come in and testify, you're not a journalist, I want you in the witness stand. Uh, has that conversation been had about structuring that relationship so as to preserve the, the best privilege argument? Um, well, as you know, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what state you're in and what, whether you waive your privilege and how. But um, uh, that's why it's important to, I, I think, to have a folder that is, you know, where you're sharing information that you don't mind being public. You know, we, uh, you don't want to put any information in there that you'd want covered by the privilege um, because of that risk. Um, you know, interviews with confidential sources, for example, that wouldn't go in there. No, that's a good point, and I, I mean, we're, we're um, our interpretation of our collaborators when they're working with us, they're doing journalism. So if a physician is with us in the field, 
um, that person, and they're reporting, and they're co-authoring a work of journalism. I mean, as you know, we don't have journalistic accreditation, right? So it's our interpretation is that they're a journalist um, and therefore they um, they enjoy privilege, but that has not been tested, so we'll see. Good morning, my name is Jeroen Trommelen. I'm the chief editor of uh, Investigo, which is a, a platform for investigative journalism in the Netherlands. Um, uh, I like to reach out to experts, to doctors, lawyers, uh, legal experts, with the question, what stories are we missing? And, well, most of the time, I rarely get good answers because the answers I get are too big, look at government, finance, or too small, my boss is harassing me. Um, so how do you get this silver bullet story out of them? It, I find it very hard. In uh, most of the workshops, we spend almost, I think, um, uh, almost two hours and giving an exercise to the participants. Can you identify the 10 most underreported stories in your country or in your region, in your state? And believe me, I was, I was in Taiwan just last week and I was fascinated by what they told me are the most underreported stories in Taiwan. I said, these are, wow, these are award-winning stories waiting to be told. Maybe they're not telling it. Of course, but they know things. Sometimes what happens is that there's a lot of self-censorship. So people know what's going wrong, but they don't want to write about it. But people is a global you know, thing. You can, if, you don't, if you're a Chinese or if, if I'm Indian, I'm not able to write about what's happening in India, I can pass on that story to BBC or CNN or Al Jazeera or New York Times for that matter. So I think it is good to have an open conversation. And I, I love a one session which I do in all the workshops about how to generate story ideas. And because I think the biggest challenge in journalism is actually getting story ideas every day, every week. You can deal with money, you can deal with legal, physical threats, because they come after you do story. You can, whether you get paid or not at the end of the month, that's just, but first you have to do that work. I think th th there is a systematic pattern, to be honest, how we can be good at like uh, developing story ideas. We have a journalist in India, to cut it short, she has been a, Ritu Sarin, I'm talking about Indian Express, a great friend of ours. Uh, she has been a reporter with a newspaper for the last 32 years. Almost every day in the last 32 years, she has a byline. And I ask her, how are you getting these ideas? And she has a remarkable story to tell because she says, I go and meet people. And I, I used to have an editor, he said, you're not a good journalist if you don't meet five new people every day. So like, there's the whole thing. I think that law we need to, because there are people like record keepers. I say, if you know the driver of a prime minister, you are the most successful reporter in your country. If you know a, a doctor who is a public record keeper in a hospital, you will get thousands of stories. You don't need to get the director of the hospital or someone or top oncologist or orthopologist. If you just need a record keeper or a peon of a director, he can give you the stories. So it's like actually f figuring out these people and building a kind of a, a systematic approach to generating story ideas. I, I mean, I'll just sort of quickly add to that. Um, I think a lot of a lot of journalists um, were probably, or so many journalists were probably on a sort of academic path at one point, and then decided to become journalists and not PhD professors, whatever. And and so, you know, we have we had or had experience at some point in our sort of academic nascent nascent period, reading academic things and just kind of pushed it away. So I think there's sort of a block, as you say, and, and they, they work in their own world and we're often resistant to it. So I think part of it is just kind of a, almost a psychological trick you have to play, is just break that down. And if someone, if someone said, like for instance, someone uh, we work with, a public health person said, you know, alcohol dependence in indigenous communities is a huge issue. It's di alcohol dependence disproportionately affects indigenous people in Canada, Australia, to a lesser extent in the US, but nevertheless statistically higher. It's like, as in first, my first instinct is like, you know, whatever, like that's great for your paper on, you know, your public health paper. But we realize that, you know, actually, you're telling me, w w journalists love superlatives, right? And this is a superlative. Um, maybe there's something there. And we ended up, we've spent three years working with indigenous communities, empowering people in those communities to tell their own stories about alcohol dependence in partnership with counselors, 
as well as public health officials and physicians. So we brought this academic rigor to it and empowered people to tell their own stories so that we're not sort of outsiders coming in telling these stories. But it all grew from the academic research and sort of being open to engaging something that feels like an issue. You know, our old boss, Don, saying, you know, we tell stories, not, not, we don't tell stories about issues, we tell stories about stories. But the issues themselves, you know, if you're open to it, then you can find those stories. I'm curious if, in that example, mm -hmm. did the researchers help you find the people? No. Right. That's no, that, well, that's it. That's exactly what you're saying, because they're, they're at 10,000 miles, right? They're, they're a very big picture. They, all, they talk about statistics, um, and, and they're not about those, and, and, and they're uncomfortable about it, particularly when it comes to indigenous uh, people in Canada, which is a, you know, kind of defined um, vulnerable class of, of people in, in, in the country. Um, they don't want to be like exploiting those stories, which is why we ended up doing the stories an empowerment journalism project where we found, we, we went to communities and we went to the chiefs of communities and we said, you know, we're, we're told this is an issue. And as soon as we said that, they're like, oh my God, do you, you don't know half of it. And then they'd go on about how alcohol is like such a huge issue in their communities. And they said, no one tells these stories. Um, and no one here wants to tell these stories because you white folks come here and exploit us and, and misrepresent us. And then, you know, then you kind of perpetuate the stereotype of the drunk, lazy Indian. So we're not going to open our doors to you. So then we started brainstorming with them. Well, how could these stories, you think these stories should be told, but we don't do them well. How could we do it better? So. Last question in the back, back, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Anna Myers. I'm, I run an international um, network of NGOs that protect whistleblowers. Um, so I'm really interested in everything you're talking about. And I, I guess I have one observation and then a question. One is when you were telling about the, the story about the cute, the cute small child as being the story, and often the whistleblowing story gets crushed immediately when the focus is on the whistleblower. Um, and I was just wondering about how much either in your newsrooms you'll look at both. So yes, there'll be a whistleblower story, but the issue behind it could be picked up for a, another part of the organization, whether it's public health, environment, those kind of things. So seeing a whistleblower and then seeing the story. And how much is anyone thinking about the whistleblower as expert? Because we have been living in an era of scientists being shut down in the Canadian government, um, for instance, um, at the EPA now in the US, and so many of them are kind of being seen as whistleblowers just because they're now doing their jobs uh, and are being told they shouldn't be doing their jobs the way they were trained to, to do. And s many whistleblowers, that's exactly where they come from. I'm being told not to do my job properly. So I was just wondering any of that, how, how, whether you've thought of it, whether it fits in, whether you think of whistleblowers as experts. That's interesting. An anyone? I mean, I think, uh, I, I would guess we've all used whistleblowers, worked with them as sources, right? Um, and because they're experts and they have both inside information and expertise, so they're tremendous. Um, I just have never thought of it as a collaboration. That's interesting, yeah. Um, no, but you're right that so many whistleblowers do ultimately, I mean, their, their lives are crushed anyway by being whistleblowers and we sometimes, compound the, the weight on their, on their lives. Um, and I mean, we've all dealt with whistleblowers, I'm sure, who've, who've suffered in, in, in various ways. Um, we've, I've never personally collaborated one with one. Uh, I mean, as you know, whistleblowers are also kind of a separate class of human beings in a way. Like, they're so passionate about what they're doing. They've been banging their head against the wall for weeks or months or years. So they, they, they get quite strident about, about their, th this issue, whatever this issue is sometimes. Um, so they can be challenging as a, as a journalist, you know, to, to as even just a source. But it could be really interesting to collaborate with them because then they would, I mean, it's kind of part of the model of our center is to empower people in, in new ways and not just treat sources as kind of um, a means to an end, but a part partnership. Um, so I, I'd love to actually explore that at some point. But there's, a, there's an extra step in there, I think. I, this is an interesting conversation. We'll have to carry it on some more uh, afterwards. But, um, you know, with a whistleblower, um, definitely what I've done with whistleblowers is have them go through data and point to, you know, do the very same things I do with a collaboration. I guess I feel like I need that extra step of having an independent, another independent outsider review it just because they have, um, they have that whistleblower status, so they're not quite independent. 
Yeah, so absolutely. I, I just tweeted something from what you were talking about anyway, about how for most whistleblowers, the biggest protection is that it's, c that it's substantiated by their peers, by people in the field, and that de-isolates immediately. Because you'll get the whistleblowers who call you and start talking about right away about I'm being harassed by my boss, like this gentleman said. Uh, and there may be a whole story behind there, but of course their immediate issue is they, they've been fighting for their professional livelihood. So if I'm advising a whistleblower, there'll often be you know, eight things, and the public interest issue is number eight. And if you tar start to say, if we, you know, if we resolve one to three, are you happy? No, in fact, the eighth is really what they want, but there's been seven other things now that they have to deal with. Mm. Anyway, it's just a point I that I thought would be. I just sort of add one, uh, one word. We have a one whistleblower in India who exposed India's biggest pharma company, which was working in America, a generic drug. And Catherine Ivan, if you have met her in the during conference, she did a book about it. The whole book is based on that whistleblower. And he became he, he, so he, he turned approval in the U.S. Got a huge award, a couple of million dollars from the U.S. government. So he naturally left the job. He set up a foundation called Thakur Foundation, based in New York, but working with Indian journalists, health journalists now. And he has offered three fellowship, international fellowships this year, and we are actually uh, building collaboration with him. And he's one of our sponsors for the next summit in Bangalore in which we're bringing doctors and journalists together. So I, I found one, one uh, some people, when they retire, they become extremely useful for journalists, more than that when they were in the service. So it's good to make a list of 100, 200 people who are going to retire in the next six months, one year. I used to do that. I used to do that actually as an exercise, annual exercise, to look at, because I covered military, so I was looking at who is the next journal who is retiring. And I used to keep the, um, I will be the first journalist to interview the journal when he retires because he was free from all things and responsibilities. Thanks. Um, anyway, we could clearly talk for much, much longer. And, uh, but I, uh, for one thing, I have a panel at Der Spiegel in 30 minutes <laughs> that I have to moderate. But I, I just want to thank our distinguished speakers here. And uh, thank you all. And you're welcome to come up and talk to these guys. I, I have to dash. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for getting up early.